In the previous video, we discussed what galvanic cells are. In this video, we're going to be discussing free energy and how free energy and, and cell potentials are related to each other. And then we're going to extend that into looking at the Nernst equation. So, first of all, delta G, we, that was a thermodynamic property that we talked about in the previous videos. And so, what is delta G again? Just in reference to this, uh, it's where we can determine if a process is spontaneous. And remember that delta G is Gibbs free energy. And in order for a process to be spontaneous, delta G must be negative. And so we're going to be looking at how the cell potential will, might affect delta G and, and whether the process is spontaneous or not. So the equation that we use for solving for delta G, if we know the cell potential, is E. And so delta G is equal to minus NFE. N represents the moles of electrons that you determine from the balanced half reaction method. So that value is determined from balancing those half reactions and previously discussed. F is Faraday's constant which is 96,485. So there's two different unit sets of units for Faraday's constant, uh, coulombs per mole or joules per volt per mole. The one on the right hand side, joules per volt per mole, will actually be more commonly used. And then E represents the cell potential. So the cell potential is determined from the way we discussed it in the previous video. So if we are given a cell potential, and let's say, for example, with the copper and zinc, our cell potential was 1.10 volts. Well, when you plug that in, when you do 1.10 volts times Faraday's constant, now the electrons that were transferred were two electrons for that, that particular cell. When we go through and we solve for that, we will end up with a negative value for Gibbs free energy. And so that tells us that that particular cell is spontaneous. Now the value that I obtained from doing 2 times negative 2 times 96,045 times 1.1 is negative 21,2267. So that would be negative 212,267 joules. And so we convert that into kilojoules and so that's going to be negative 212 kilojoules so that is very spontaneous it's a very negative value so that means that that reaction between the copper and zinc with that cell potential is spontaneous so as we talk about you know if we were to be given delta G, we also could calculate the cell potential E. And so you can go back and forth with this depending on what's given to you. It's just a matter of simple algebra, you know, converting one to the other. So under standard conditions, now the, the previous slide, all I've done here is added the, the not symbol up top. You can see where I kind of pointed at that. What does that mean? That means that you're at 25 degrees Celsius, all the concentrations are one molar, and the atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere. What if you're not under those conditions? What if the concentrations are not all one molar? Then we will end up having to use a different equation. And so an equation we learned in the previous chapter was delta G is equal to delta G naught plus RT natural log of Q. What we're going to do with that equation is we're going to we're going to use that equation and what we just talked about in cell potential, how we related it in Faraday's constant. We're going to rearrange this equation into what is called the Nernst equation. So instead of using delta G, we have minus NFE for both of the delta G and delta G naught. So we divide each side by N minus NF, we get 
uh, the starting of what is called Nernst equation. And so we go through some basic algebra and what we end up having is an equation where E is equal to naught minus 0 0.0592 over N times the log of Q. And so what you determine here is you can see that we have the cell potential under non-standard conditions where this this cell potential with the not symbol that is actually determined the way we determined it in the previous video n is the number of moles of electrons and then q is the reaction quotient remember the reaction quotient is equal to the concentration of products to some power divided by the concentration of reactants this goes back to your equilibrium chapter and setting up that equilibrium expression so you would be given the concentrations and you'd have to plug those in after balancing the equation so that way you know what your x and y x and y are the coefficients from the balanced equation now uh, the concentration cells they this is where what we see a cell that is set up to have a similar metal on both sides acting as the met, as the anode and the cathode and one of the things that I like to discuss here is a cell phone because a cell phone really follows this pretty closely if you've ever had your cell phone die which I know most of you probably have your cell phone you, you kind of get a little you freak out a little bit it's like oh no and then you try to cut it back on and it, and it cuts itself back on and so you're all happy after that but then you start trying to use it and within about five minutes it cuts back off and you're no longer able to cut it on again what's going on there that's because it's a concentration cell as long as you have a variant of concentrations as long as the concentrations are not equal to each other you're going to have a cell potential and so what happens is is that it's almost like an equilibrium as long as you're on one side or the other side of the equilibrium you can move forward in one way but once you get to the bottom and this is where the concentrations are equal to each other what happens then is the the cell potential basically becomes neutral and the voltage that you see is zero volts so this is an application of of the Nernst equation and that goes back to the Q that we were just talking about as long as Q is not one you're gonna have a cell potential but as long as the concentrations are different, E will not be zero. So a problem that you can look at example-wise is the last problem of the day posted. And it's on the second page. It's the first problem on that page in that packet. What you got to remember when you set up the Nernst equation you got to remember to set up Q. Q is basically the equilibrium expression where you have to have the balanced equation first. Then also from the balanced equation, you have to figure out N from the number of moles that, of electrons that are transferred. And then E naught is determined from what we talked about in the previous video. And so putting these three parts together will allow you to calculate the cell potential under non-standard conditions depending on the on what the situation is so the only way to, do, to get good at this is to practice this and and that just requires you to dig in into some of the examples that are in the textbook and the problems of the day and any other resources that you might find online so the last thing I want to just kind of cover with you, and I'm going to do this very quickly, are batteries. Batteries basically is the topic of 
this chapter in trying to understand how batteries work. So if we look at this slide, we have two different batteries. We have a, a car battery, which is on the left, and then we have a lot of just a regular old battery on the right hand side. If you've ever picked up a car battery, they're really heavy because they're composed of lead. And inside that battery, you do not turn it upside down because it has sulfuric acid in it. We call that a wet cell battery. On the right hand side with the flashlight batteries, the flashlight batteries are dry cell. If you pick it up and you shake it, you never hear fluid or liquid moving inside because it's not, it does not have any fluid in it. But it does have a certain setup. Now both of these setups are very similar in the way that they respond to whenever you turn the, the device on. So in an alkaline battery, you have two different parts. You have the cathode and you have the anode. The anode has the, the potassium hydroxide and the cathode is where the reduction is gonna take place. So the electron will travel from the anode to the cathode. If you've ever known, uh, if you look at your batteries and you look at the way they're set up in your calculator, you have, or, or in a flashlight, you know that they always are are opposite from each other. You always are going to have negative positive, negative positive, negative positive, and that's because how the electron travels through. And if you pay attention to the number of batteries, so a, a normal calculator, TI 83, has how many batteries in it? It has four AAA batteries. Now, AAA batteries is a smaller battery size, but if you look at the voltage of a AAA battery, that voltage is right around 1.5 volts. It is 1.5 if you look at the battery itself. And how many batteries are there? There's four batteries. They put those batteries in series with each other. And that way the total voltage between all the batteries to, to combine together is six volts. Now, if we look at a car battery, can go back to the previous slide. If we look at a car battery, a car battery it's supposed to measure 12 volts. Each of the cells that you see set up here have two volts. And so you're gonna have six of these cells set up inside of a car battery, and that's what gives you the 12 volts. The unique thing about a car battery is it's rechargeable because of how they set it up. Notice that the anode is a lead grid filled with spongy lead, and then the cathode is a lead grid filled with lead oxide. And what that does is it allows for, when your car cut on, the alternator reverses the current. That's what an alternator does, it alternates the current. And it allows for the reverse of the electrons to go back to their original position. And that way your car battery never dies unless your alternator dies or the light, or if it's just an old battery that's been through many cycles. They do make uh, AAA batteries and AA batteries that are rechargeable. And you also know that your cell phone works on the same principle, except your cell phone is composed of lithium ion batteries. When you plug your, your phone in, you're, it's gonna reverse the charge and it's gonna put the electrons back where they originally came from and it's gonna build that lithium metal back up. You know that if you are using your phone, you should not be charging it at the same time because you're counteracting both of those. And that's usually when your cell phone gets really hot. And even sometimes those old Samsung phones would blow up on people for that reason. So we're going to conclude this video now. I appreciate you guys sticking with me and thanks for watching.